Welcome back. This is our 21st show in a series of shows entitled Rehabilitation Coming Soon, where we have been discussing the mass incarceration practices of the United States and the effects of those practices on the state of Hawaii. I'm Aaron Wills, a William, William S. Richardson Law School graduate and a research consultant for Abigail Kwananakoa Research Center and a paralegal for retired Judge Mike Towns' private mediation practice. Over the past four months, we have heard from numerous professionals in the community who are willing to discuss the criminal justice system and see the problem of mass incarceration from different perspectives. Today, we'd like to hear the perspective from the Chief Public Defender, Jack Tanaki. <clears throat> Jack, Tan Jack Tanaki uh, joined the Office of Public Defender as a trial attorney in 1985 and has been leading the office since his appointment in 2000. Mr. Tanaki has, has extensive trial experience, having handled over 150 jury trials throughout his career. Mr. Tanaki earned a Bachelor's of Arts degree from the University of Hawaii at Manoa in 1982 and a Juris Doctorate from the University of California, Hastings College of Law in 1985. Welcome, Jack, to the show, and thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me, Harry. All right. Well, the first thing that I want to um, kind of just approach is just, you know, what kind of cases do the Public Defender's Office, you, how, how, what kind of cases do they usually take on? Well, we um, uh, are under a statute, statutory authority to take um, uh, any cases uh, involving indigent uh, criminal defendants. In, in other words, those are uh, defendants who cannot afford to hire private counsel. And we handle any type of case that uh, has the possibility of a jail term. So in real terms, you're talking about everything from uh, the most minor of cases, such as petty theft, uh, disorderly conduct, uh, driving under the influence, all the way to the, the, the most uh, serious cases, some of the stuff that you see in the media, mm -hmm. such as homicide, sexual assault, uh, and um, we have uh, about 103 attorneys statewide, and we, our offices operate um, on every major island. Our main office is in Honolulu. We have offices in Kauai, Maui, and two offices on the Big Island, Hilo and Kona. Okay. And so if you're a person who can actually afford private counsel, you can't get the public defender's office no. help, is that right? It, we, we do a financial qualification. So yeah. with each client that comes into the office uh, seeking, uh, pri uh, seeking public defender services, mm -hmm. we have them fill out a financial statement. So you um, have to be... Uh, Depending on the type of case, you have to qualify financially to, for us to uh, take that case. Okay. And how many public defenders do you guys have in your office right now? Uh, we have about 103 uh, attorneys uh, statewide, as I said, and we appear in um, every uh, level of the state courts, from district court, which handles the uh, misdemeanor, petty misdemeanor, the most uh, uh, the less serious cases, to family court, which handles juvenile cases and domestic violence, to the circuit court, which handles uh, uh, felony cases, okay. and also we uh, do cases on appeal to the Intermediate Court of Appeals as well as the Supreme Court. Oh, wow. Okay. Now, what is the current structure of your office? How, how, do you, how is the office run? I mean, do you guys have like a group of supervisors, a bunch of yeah. teams you guys work with? We, um, we have, a, uh, as, as in every state office, we have a supervisory staff that administers uh, uh, a staff of attorneys that mans e each particular court. So mm -hmm. um, mainly we, we structure our office to go by the level of case that, that is handled in, in that particular court. So, for instance, Honolulu, we have a district court section, handles uh, a lot of the traffic offenses as well as the, the more uh, the misdemeanor, petty misdemeanor criminal offenses, the things I talked about, like mm -hmm. uh, uh, petty theft, disorderly conduct, uh, simple assaults, you know, barroom mm -hmm. fights, those kind of things. Um, and then we have the family court division, which handles uh, juvenile offenders. Uh, as well as domestic violence, and then our circuit court division, which uh, handles um, the more serious felony offenses. That's things that you see in the media. Right, right. Now, I know you guys, you know, you kind of, I mean, the, I know a lot of public defenders, and I've had a lot of friends who, who are actually public defenders, sure. and, you know, they don't complain about their caseload, but it's just known. You know, yeah. when you work as a law clerk, you know that the public defenders right. have a high caseload. What are some reasons for that? I mean... Well, uh, 
the biggest reason is that uh, over the years, the legislature has passed more and more uh, criminal offenses, mm -hmm. and um, which affect a lot more people and are outlawing um, more and more types of conduct, uh, and uh, also adding to the, uh, the the high case loads are people are just unable to afford private attorneys. Right, yeah, if that's true, uh, I'll give you an example. If you are charged with a DUI. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a simple, pretty simple case, happens every day. Uh, uh, you need to probably have two to $3,000 yeah. in liquid assets to, to, to uh, hire a private counsel. Yeah. Um, and that's at the low end, mm -hmm. okay? It, it, if if um, you get charged with something like a burglary or any type of felony offense, it, it just goes up from there. So, mm -hmm. you know, simple burglary, you might, you might need five to $10,000 to hire a private attorney. Right. So you can imagine how many people cannot afford to hire right. counsel or to hire attorneys for their children who may, who may get in trouble. Oh, that's absolutely so, yeah. true. Well, let's kind of switch gears here and let's <coughs> sure. talk about the specialty courts. Um, you know, I know there's a, and, and these are just the ones I know of, mm -hmm. uh, you can, drug court, mental health court, Veterans Court and Hope Probation, and we can take those apart each by one if we want to. Um, but how, how are these specialty courts benefiting defendants? Well, the, the specialty courts have really blossomed in the last probably 20 to 30 years in our court system. And um, I think that the, the main motivating factor for creating these, these various specialty courts uh, were the, the the growing number of cases, especially drug cases in the case of drug court. Drug mm -hmm. court, uh, actually the, 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 the first real specialty court was the family court system mm, that's because right. mm -hmm. um, that's the system where uh, you dealt with the juvenile offenses. So, but you know, that structurally was created by the judiciary um, a long time ago. But so I would say that that was the first specialty courts. But then in recent years, the last 20 to 30 years, you have courts which address different types of subject matter and the drug court is probably the, mm -hmm. the, the original type of this specialty court and that the theory behind drug court is uh, there's so many offenses which are either directly involving drugs like possession of drugs distribution yeah. of drugs or are a symptom of drug use yeah. drug abuse like theft a lot of people have mm -hmm. to commit theft burglaries to uh, Support to their support habits. their habit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the drug court came about as a way to, to deal with all of these cases and all of the problems that are caused by substance abuse. And then from, from there, uh, you had development of other types of courts, the most recent of which is the Veterans Treatment Court, mm -hmm. which you have so many veterans now are coming back, especially after the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, and they're having some real adjustment problems. Yeah. And um, those problems I include a lot of times substance use, excessive substance use, but also a lot of domestic problems. So um, a lot of, you, you have combat veterans that are suffering from post-traumatic stress syndrome and, and those types of uh, ailments. And so the Veterans Court was developed as a way to, to, to recognize what, um, these veterans were, were suffering from, recognize their unique problems, and uh, try to treat those problems humanely and compassionately. Uh, and it's been a real success. Um, so that, that's basically, in a nutshell, the, the, how these uh, specialty courts came about. Cool. Well, you know, I, I used to work for Hope Probation as a law clerk for a while. And, um, you know, one thing that I kind of you know, Judge Alm always tried to prepare what he called, or compare what he called probation as usual versus whole probation. Yes. So, you know, and I, when I looked at it and I took a step back, I says, you know, if you're going to have to be put under a whole bunch of rules mm -hmm. for probation, whole probation is the best thing there's going. Right. Because the way it works is if you follow the rules for two years, Judge Alm cuts your probation, right. you know, at the two-year mark. Yeah. Okay, there's no more reason for you to go through any more of this because mm -hmm. you've showed for two years that you can pass all the drug tests. You can, you know, follow all your probation officer's right. rules. So, I mean, I think programs like that really need to get more attention because, you know, if you're going to have a bunch, the only, the problem is on the back end of it, if you're, if you're one person that messes up a lot, you're going to do a lot of jail sure. time. 
So, sure. yeah, and you know, uh, programs like that have uh, hope probation and drug court have uh, their success is proven, and they've saved so many people from uh, what would have been longer jail terms. So it it the these courts pay off uh, from the standpoint that. Um, not only do they um, compassionately treat the offenders, but they also save the state uh, a lot of money because it costs a heck of a lot to, to incarcerate yes. uh, people. That's right, because the incarceration, I believe, costs somewhere around fifty to 60000 a year yes. or more. Yeah. yeah, And then, yeah, when we go into the numbers deeper, when it's a, um, well, if a woman gets incarcerated and she has a, three children and she's mm -hmm. a single parent, you know, and all the kids become exactly. wards of the state. and. So the cost goes up from there exponentially. Um, let's see, where is there something I was going to ask you about? Um, oh, um, to go into, just to ask a little bit about drug court. Um, I know there's a long wait list for drug court, mm -hmm. and that constantly is an issue because the demand for to get into drug court right. is so high. Is the problem really drug court, or is it because there's not enough rehabilitation programs out there to serve the amount of need that we actually have? Yeah. Well, I, I think we, we could expand drug court um, uh, uh, to more than it is right now. But you're right, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the limitations of these courts, and that's drug court, hope probation included, is the availability of, of um, uh, substance abuse programming. Yeah. And, um, you know, because the, the courts themselves cannot engage, as you know, in a day-to-day -day, uh, counseling uh, mm -hmm. of uh, the, 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 the people, the clients that are in the, the program. That has to fall upon the, the substance abuse programs. Right. So um, there is a great need for that. More money needs to be put into uh, these programs to, to so that they can accommodate um, uh, more uh, persons you know and I mean the 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 issue is always money but in, in my opinion the state has to look at it uh, uh, from the standpoint of well how much does it cost to right. incarcerate this person if, if they're not going to be following the rules or if they're going to persist with their their substance abuse problem it's going to cost a lot more to as you said 50 to 60 thousand or more uh, a year to incarcerate that person as opposed to pouring some of that money, a fraction of that money into the uh, substance abuse programs. Right. So it's uh, kind of like maintaining a car, you know, you, 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 if you don't put money into the maintenance of the car, you're going to pay an end with a big repair bill. So, yeah. yeah. And bringing that up, and we'll go into this, um, we'll talk a little bit about um, the overcrowding issue we have at OCCC and Halava right now. So uh, we will be right back uh, with Jack Tanaki. My name is Aaron Wills, and this is Rehabilitation Coming Soon. Hi, I'm Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist here in Hawaii, and I'm the host of Shrink Wrap Hawaii, which is on Tuesdays at 3 o'clock. Have a great summit. Take care of your mental health. Aloha, my name is Danelia, D-A-N-E-L-I-A. -E and I'm the other half of the duo, John Newman. We are the co-hosts of Keys to Success, which is live on ThinkTech live streaming network series weekly on Thursdays at 11 a.m. Aloha. Aloha. Hey, everybody. My name is David Chang, and I am a new host for the show, The Art of Thinking Smart. I'm really excited to be able to share with you how to get the smart edge in life. We're going to have awesome guests in the military, business, political, nonprofit world. So no matter what background you're from, we have something for you. Please join us every other Thursday at 10 a.m. at thinktechhawaii.com or on the theartofthinkingsmart.com. I look forward to seeing you. Just Welcome back. I'm Aaron Wills, and this is Rehabilitation Coming Soon, and we are sitting here with our guest, Jack Tanaki. Okay, Jack, um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, um, the, there's been a lot of articles written about the overcrowding issue um, that's going on at OCCC. Uh, we see it because, like I said, I work in Hope Probation, so you hear the, the defendants complain about it all yes. the time. Um, and then 
there's also an issue about halaba. And one of the things they brought up about OCCC is that, you know, it was built in 1913 or something like that. And everything, exactly. like you said, no yeah. maintenance is really right. been put into it and it's falling apart. Yeah. Um, how bad is the issue over there, if you can comment on it at all, or even if you know, and uh, do you think a new jail needs to be built or should we build it like the, some of the ideas are just to put one on top of Holava and have both of them housed in the same area, I guess? Yeah. Well, you know, it, it is almost at a crisis level. Um, the, the overcrowding, the, the condition of the facilities, um, I don't, you know, there, there are other people who can speak about that, but uh, as, as I see it, it, it it's, it's a crisis level and something is going to need to be done in, in the, next, uh, uh, the next decade at least, yeah. if not sooner. Um, but the, the, the question and the debate at this point is going to be, what do we do? Do we, you know, maintain the current facilities that we have? Um, do, do we upgrade those or do we build a new facility? And that's a, it's a huge political football. I yeah. think that's been kicked around for I don't know how many years. And uh, um, I would like to see, and I, I think the, the city prosecutors also spoke about this, that you know, uh, developing more of um, like a minimum security facility, which includes uh, 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 a very prolific substance abuse uh, aspect to it. Uh, rather than building these big monstrosities with all of these walls, uh, yeah. I mean, there there are always going to be um, you, you're going to there's going to be a need for for some facility like that to house the most dangerous yeah. uh, prisoners. But uh, the vast majority of them are are not uh, a serious uh, public safety danger. But yeah. they do have a lot of issues like substance abuse and. They will continue to commit property crimes if if their substance abuse uh, issues are not addressed. So, um, I think the majority of the prison population they they need to take that view toward it uh, yeah. the, from the rehabilitation because you know eighty to ninety percent or maybe more of these prisoners will return to society at some point, yeah. and they need to have the tools to to uh, reintegrate back into the community. Yep, no, I agree. We had Senator Sparrow on here, as I told you before the show, and, uh, you know, he got on here, and he was, I, you know, as I was following the way he was talking about the way he was supporting this, he was always on board of building new places. Mm -hmm. Well, he came on our show and said now he's off board of that because it's going to cost, he said, in right. the range of somewhere over a billion dollars yeah. for two new facilities. And so what he was suggesting is building what he calls a re-entry program, a re-entry building where they come and they stay there and it's kind of like they do these re-entry programs until they're ready to be released out into society. And, I, you know, my whole thing that I, you know, we started the show on was we wanted to try to bring awareness of we're spending 50, 60 million dollars a year giving CCA to manage our prisoners right. in Arizona. We need to bring those people back. We need a facility to put them. But as you said, and, and Warden Patterson brought this up, it's it's like our, our system is a cookie cutter system. Mm -hmm. Because we have some really bad criminals that we have to house in maximum right. security, we also have to house everybody else there too. Yeah. And so it, it does need to be a different system. And I don't know really what the answer is um, other than, I mean, I believe that we need to spend the money, you know, because yeah. these the crimes aren't going down. And the people over there who are doing their time, it's, you know, um, Senator Sparrow brought it to the point where it was, was at like 1,800, now it's down to like 1,500. I mean, if we go in at that rate, yeah. it'll never go down below 1,000, you know, in exactly. 20 years. So. And, you know, I mean, it, I, I think when, when you speak to uh, people who are very committed, like Senator Sparrow and um, many others who are in the uh, criminal justice system, we're, we're pretty much all in agreement as to yeah. what's needed, but it, it just needs to be solidified and put into action. A, a re-entry center is an excellent idea. Yeah. And that, that's just a different take, I think, than what I spoke about earlier, uh, about a minimum security yeah. facility yeah. With, with substance abuse. So, you know, we're not, you know, off on way different right. pages on this, but at some point there needs to be a commitment uh, by the state and um, uh, it, it, I, I know they're trying to get this done and there's some real committed leaders so hopefully you know we can see some movement on this 
I agree. It needs, it needs to really happen right now. Um, so I wanted to ask you, uh, what are some hot button cases right now at the PDs as far as uh, what's going on? Well, you know, of course, uh, drug cases are, are always there. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, that is probably substance, either possession, distribution of drugs, or property crimes that are, are caused by people supporting drug habits. It's always probably going to make up, you know, 75 percent of our cases or more. Um, right now, one of the real hot button issues that we're trying to address is uh, uh, these offenses which are a recent creation of the city council and the, um, the legislature to criminalize a lot of the homeless issues. Mm -hmm. So we're dealing with a, a, a really uh, high uh, increase in cases like being in a closed park and um, you know sidewalk violations and those type of things um, and uh, the, these these cases are problematic uh, from many standpoints so one is just that you know they mainly target the homeless population and the, these uh, the, that population really has no place to go other than the parks and and they can kick them out of a park or they can kick them off the sidewalk and they just move right, right, right. down the block mm -hmm. so now you have instead of one violation you got two violations and it, it's endless and um, but it, it also has unintended circumstance uh, consequences because uh, you have a lot of kids back from college high school kids that are getting caught in the closed parks so um, uh, you know, I've told my own son, don't be in a park. They, they play this Pokemon Go game. <laughs> and I've told him, don't be in a park. Pass, you got to look at the sign when the park closes. Because what happens is the citation, the police come to the park, they issue these citations, it involves a court date. And mm -hmm. you got to get an attorney right. and everything. A lot of people think, well, we can just pay it by mail or it's like a traffic citation. That's not the case because the, the law that was created created a criminal offense. So... Now you got to get an attorney. You got to go to court, and if they're, you know, back home from uh, college uh, for the for the summer, you know, they they got to move around their court date to to adjust to uh, when they're going to be back home again. So it's a big, it's it, it's a hassle, and it's it was never intended to. I don't think it was ever intended to criminalize the, these people, but that's the effect that it it's had. So it's been an overreaction to the. The homeless situation from the standpoint of making these violations criminal and then it just ensnares all of these other people. So how long has that law been on the book? Has it been on for a year it, yet? It's been on, uh, the closed parks has been on for a few years now. Yeah. So how but many it, cases it, a year do you see just closed park cases? Actually, the, there, I think between the last fiscal year and this fiscal year there was an increase of I think about the last statistics I saw from the court of a few thousand cases. Wow. So it, and it may have been on the books earlier, but it wasn't really being enforced. Right. And, right, but right. now, you know, because of all of the, the pressure from the public mm -hmm. regarding uh, uh, people in the park and on the sidewalks, mm -hmm. the, the police have started enforcing it. So. Oh, I can understand that, so, and that doesn't sound like there's an easy answer to that because, no, you know, like we were it, talking about earlier, the homeless issue, like, yeah. you know, they're just moving them around. Right. They're not really solving the actual underlying yeah. issue, which is the cost of living. And, <laughs> you know, we, we've fought against these bills in the legislature, uh, but unfortunately they're, and, I mean, it's understandable if you, if you live or work in a certain area of town and, um, you know, you start seeing encampments uh, mm -hmm. crop up in that area of town. It it is somewhat upsetting, and um, but there's a lot of public pressure on, on the politicians, so they react in really the only easy way that I mean, the easiest way they know how is pass a pass a criminal law. But that's really not the answer. Right. It, it can't be the answer in the long run. Actually, I just I don't think they really thought it really you know through because if they criminalize all these actions, these people have no money. What goes back on the public exactly. defenders, yeah. which is just another state agency yeah. sucking up all the resources. But so uh, let's talk so, talk about how Hawaii is compared to other states. Um, how is Hawaii compared as far as violent crime is concerned? 
um, to other states in the community? I think from, from, from that standpoint, uh, violent crime, we're, we're very lucky. Um, we, uh, I mean, you hear about cases uh, involving, you know, homicide and, um, you know, shooting, stabbings, but those are relatively rare. Um, we, 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 you know, you, you just heard about this case on the mainland where Dwayne Wade's yeah. uh, uh, cousin, yes, cousin was, was shot. Was shot. And, we, we, and we, for the most part, we don't have those types of incidents happening here. And, and one of the reasons for that is Hawaii has very strict gun laws. And that's why in this whole debate about, and, uh, and I understand the Second Amendment, uh, the, the, the people who are strong on the Second Amendment, but, um, you know, Hawaii is very restrictive in where you can carry a firearm, how you have to yeah. secure the firearm. Um, how many bullets you can have in your magazine. Exactly. Ten. So yeah. the semi-automatics are, yeah. are, are um, outlawed. Uh, so, you know, um, that really does have an effect, I, I, I think, be, because, you know, although you do see the occasional gun violence here, it's, it's not on the scale of other major cities that, that are of like size. Yeah, just to give a little background on, on what Jack is talking about, uh, Dwayne Wade's cousin is a, was a female walking on the side of the street with, I believe, a daughter, right. a, walking her daughter. And there was an um, exchange of gunfire between, we, they think, gang members, and she was hit as a bystander yeah. and killed. And so, and, and if you know Chicago, and if you know anything about the history of Chicago, they've had gun violence and gun issues over there, you know, and they have very strict yeah. gun laws there too, but it doesn't seem to help. Yeah. The, and, you know, I mean, Chicago violence. is not a real good comparison with Honolulu. It's, it's, it's a lot larger, like L.A., that kind of thing. Yeah, but yeah. It, 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 I, I do think that uh, by having these very restrictive gun laws here, it, it discourages, um, uh, you know, those types of, of crimes right. going on. I agree. Um, well, we're at the end of our show, so thank you very much, Jack, for coming on our show today. Thank you, Aaron. It was a pleasure. All right. And uh, so join us next week for another uh, show of rehabilitation coming soon as we continue our discussion of the criminal justice system and the effect of mass incarceration on the state of Hawaii. And stay tuned because coming up next is Sustainable Hawaii with Kirsten Turner. Thank you.